Hey, Netrunners, we need to talk about Personal Workshop. When this card first came out, you know, I didn't really understand just how strong it was until someone explained it to me. Uh, nor did I really understand the rules uh, of how to use it. So I'm making this video to explain to all of you what I've learned, because even though this card has been out for a while, there's still a lot of people who are getting it wrong or are simply not getting the full potential out of it. It's worth four influence for a reason. Let's get our money's worth. The first thing you need to do with Personal Workshop is install it. Spend a click, play your Personal Workshop. The cost is one credit. Play the one credit. Remember, don't try to use Kate's ability on Personal Workshop. Per Kate's ability only applies to programs and hardware. Personal Workshop is a resource. You don't get a discount to install it with Kate. The next thing we need to do with our personal workshop is to host cards on it. Basically, put stuff in the workshop to work on. We use the ability which says, spend a click, then host a program or a piece of hardware from your grip on personal workshop. So we're going to get a pipeline. And then we place power counters on it equal to its install cost. So the install cost of pipeline is three. So we're going to put three power counters onto the pipeline to match the install cost. Something that's not obvious about Personal Workshop upon reading it is that there is no limit to the number of cards you can host in one workshop at the same time. We'll spend a click and we will go get another program. How about this YAG? We put our five power counters onto the YAG according to its five install cost. And now we've got a YAG and a pipeline hosted in the same workshop at the same time. Something a lot of new players get wrong is they think the hosted cards in the workshop are installed. These cards are not installed. You cannot use them. They are not installed. They are hosted. The benefit is that they're not taking up any memory. So if we had a magnum opus and a battering ramp that were installed using up all of our memory, we would not have any conflict uh, at all with these hosted cards that are not installed yet. You'll notice the next thing the workshop says is that when your turn begins, remove one power counter from a hosted card. So with our two cards hosted in the workshop, right, we will reset our turn. A new turn begins, and we will remove our one counter from a hosted card, not one counter from each hosted card. This is wrong. A lot of people get this wrong. Remove one counter total, pipeline or YAG, not both, not both. For the sake of example, we'll put a third card in the workshop, a rabbit hole. This means at the beginning of our turn, we can remove one from pipeline or one from YAG, or we can remove one from the rabbit hole. Now let's get a little crazy. What if we had two workshops? This means we remove one counter from each workshop. So we could remove one from this rabbit hole. In fact, we must remove one from the rabbit hole because it's the only card in that workshop. And the other workshop, we can remove one from pipeline or remove one from the YAG. Okay, so keep in mind this requirement that when your turn begins, remove one power counter from a hosted card can get you into trouble, right? Uh, because when there are no power counters left on a hosted card, you must install it, ignoring all costs. This rabbit hole has one counter left. When our turn starts, the rabbit hole will have no counters left, and therefore it will become installed. Totally sweet. We're going to get us a free rabbit hole. What could be wrong with that? Paid nothing for it. Well, there is one problem, right? Rabbit hole says when rabbit hole is installed, you may search your stack for another copy of rabbit hole and install it by paying its install cost and then shuffle the stack. Well, I have a gigantic pile of credits here to do a demo, but you're probably not going to have a gigantic pile of credits. You're probably just going to have one credit alone. Well, that means when that rabbit hole gets installed, you won't be able to afford to pay for the other two rabbit holes you probably have in your deck to install those as well, losing the rabbit hole ability.
Now you might think with just one credit you could install the second rabbit hole because you are Kate. Well, the fact is, when the first rabbit hole got installed from the workshop, that was the first hardware you installed that turn, Kate's ability disappeared, it's going to cost you four credits to install the other two rabbit holes. One of the other problems people run into with personal workshop is when there's a program, such as this pipeline, with only one counter remaining. That program is going to take up a memory, and it's going to be forced to be installed at the beginning of the turn, just like the rabbit hole of our last example. So, when we install this pipeline, we're in big trouble because we're going to have to throw away either the battering ram or the magnum opus as they are currently using all of our available memory. That sucks. The final and most powerful aspect of Personal Workshop is the paid ability. Personal Workshop says, for one credit, you may remove one power counter from a hosted card. So, in its most basic usage, right, we will spend one, two, three credits to use the paid ability three times. To remove any three power counters, we'll remove them all from Pipeline. If you recall, when there are no power counters left on a hosted card, install it, ignoring all costs. Pipeline has no power counters left on it. We get to install it, ignoring all costs. Here's the dinosaur. All good. Well, that didn't seem very hard. What's so complicated about that? Well, let's take a look at the timing structure of a turn. Whenever a paid ability can be triggered, a green swirly arrow appears. You'll notice this green swirly arrow appears all over the place. The ability to remove a power counter from a hosted card on Personal Workshop at the cost of one credit is a paid ability. That means you can use it before the corporation's turn begins, before they take their first action and after the mandatory draw, after each of their actions, and after they discard. This means you can install cards that are hosted on Personal Workshop during the corporation's turn at many, many times. You can also install these cards before your turn begins, after each of your actions, and after your own discard phase. This is almost all the time. This is crazy. Let me show you how crazy it can get. The greatest weakness of Personal Workshop is that it can be trashed. Right? It's a resource. So if you're to get tagged, the corporation can spend two credits and one click to destroy a resource, including Personal Workshop. They could also, say, spend two clicks and four credits, right, to destroy two workshops, whatever. The point is, is that if a Personal Workshop is trashed, not only do you lose the Personal Workshop, you will also lose every card hosted on that workshop. If you have been working on those cards for a while in the workshop, you just lost a lot of effort and a lot of lost power tokens, right? If you lose a workshop with a lot of cards on it, this can be a truly devastating blow that not only hurts your economy severely, but can lose you the game. So what does all that talk about trashing have to do with the timing chart? Well, remember, if you get tagged, they can come and destroy your workshops, but Whatever they did to tag you probably counts as an action, such as scoring this posted bounty. Anytime the corporation scores agendas, you can use paid abilities. You got tagged, now you can pay the paid ability of Workshop to install those cards before the corporation's next action, which they would use to destroy your workshops. So, they score a posted bounty, they forfeit it, you get a tag, and you say, wait a minute, hold up. Don't do your next action yet. I want to use my paid ability right now. Since we have a mountain of credits for this demo, let's pay off everything. We're gonna pay one, two, three credits to rescue the pipeline. We'll put that in the dinosaur. We'll spend one credit to rescue this mem chip. All right? one credit. We'll spend two credits to rescue this rabbit hole, and why not? Let's spend four more to rescue these conveniently placed second and third rabbit holes at the top of my stack. And then, now that we have a mem chip installed, let's spend three credits to rescue the yog, right, to install that. Isn't that crazy? We expanded the memory on the corporation's turn to make it possible for the yog and the pipeline to be installed simultaneously. 
Now, we're not completely safe, right? These workshops are still vulnerable to the tag, which we have not removed. The corporation will still come and trash both of the workshops, ending our workshop days, unless we draw our third workshop, which we probably should have in there. But we managed to rescue all of our cards. We can break every kind of ice. The corporation is in big trouble. Here is the timing structure of a run. You'll notice that there are a whole bunch more times that you can trigger the paid ability of Personal Workshop. You can use it as you approach a new server during your run. You can use it as the corp is resing ice. You can use it as you are interacting with a resed ice. You can use it right after you pass the final piece of ice before your final decision of whether to jack out or not. And you can use it right before you access cards and your run is considered successful. That is incredibly powerful. Let's look at some sample runs to see why. All right, let us pretend we have a corporate opponent. They have one remote server. The remote server has an unresed ice and an unresed card. We decide we want to make a run there. So our turn begins. We must remove a token from each workshop, so we must remove one from this pipeline. And then we choose to remove one from the Yog rather than the rabbit hole. Now is the time to make our run. So we will spend a click and we'll make a run on the server. You might be thinking, whoa, that's crazy. You only have a battering ram. If that's a barrier, you're okay. But what if that's a code gate or a sentry? Shouldn't you have installed the Yog or the pipeline first into the dinosaur before running? That way you could deal with it? And the answer is no, because a paid ability, like the one on Workshop, can be used many, many times, including during the run. These abilities on the Icebreakers, they're paid abilities. You use them to interact with ice even after that ice is rezzed, right? So why can't we use the Workshop ability at the same time? In fact, we can use the Workshop ability at the same time. So let's make our run even though our Breakers are still hosted and see what happens. Now, we don't have enough memory to install both of these icebreakers, but we can install one. And we know for a fact that that ice can only be one of three kinds. It can be a barrier, a sentry, or a code gate. I guess it could be a data mine, but I'm not too worried about that, right? Uh, so, we'll make our run, and we'll install the one icebreaker that we need. There is no way we can get caught without having the appropriate icebreaker. So we run... We see it's an Enigma, perfect, we have our Yog ready. But what if we had installed the pipeline before the run started, right? We don't have enough memory to put the Yog in, so we would have had to trash that pipeline, right, in order to install the Yog. By leaving both of them in the workshop, we were able to see the ice first, and then install the appropriate icebreaker, that we needed and leaving the other one safely in the workshop for later not losing it. So we'll bring out our Yog. We will make a really awesome Yogasaurus, right? Boom, Yogasaurus, so powerful. It's strength five. The Enigma is a strength two. Yog says pay zero credits to bake code gate subroutine. We break, right? We're right through that Enigma. None of its subroutines execute and we score that posted bounty, giving us one point. All right, let's imagine a slightly more complicated scenario, right? We run and run this server, it has two ice. If there is a code gate and a sentry, all right, ice there, we might be in trouble. Uh, luckily, I think we have enough cards on the table to handle pretty much anything. So, let's run that server. The corporation will res the first ice. It's a hunter. It's a sentry. We actually have two choices here. Uh, we could, one, pay two credits to remove the two remaining tokens from this pipeline to install it, right? We would have to install it in the Dinosaurus, which is actually a pretty good idea considering the strength of the hunter is four. The strength of the pipeline is only one. It would cost us six credits just to get the strength up. Seven credits to break a hunter with a naked pipeline. If we were to put it in here, it would only cost us three credits to, to break the hunter with the dinosaur pipeline. Uh, so that's one possible move, right, that we could do. Uh, another possible move 
would be to spend one credit to remove one token from the mem chip, making it installed, getting memory in the middle of a run, mind you, right? And then spend two credits to bring out the pipeline outside of the dinosaur, right? We could save that dinosaur for our Yog when the time is right. That would be not the best move because, as I said before, it would cost seven credits to break a hunter with a non-boosted pipeline. A third option would be to recognize the hunter only has one subroutine, which is a trace three. We have no link right now, but we do have a rabbit hole in this workshop. So in the middle of the run, we could spend two credits to bring to remove two tokens from this rabbit hole, which would bring it onto the table. And you'll note when rabbit hole is installed, you may search your stack for another rabbit hole and install that. Look at this. In the middle of a run, we're installing rabbit holes. Spend two. And then search the stack. Another uh, in the middle of the run, we have used the paid ability right, of the personal workshop to remove tokens from the rabbit hole, which would make it become installed, which would trigger the ability of the rabbit hole to search for and install more rabbit holes, installing three rabbit holes in the middle of the run to deal with the hunter. I have a pile of credits for demonstration purposes that uh, hunter is not going to stop us, or the corporation is going to have to spend a lot to boost that trace. Okay, so we continue with this run. Hmm? The corporation reses an enigma, which is a code gate. We're going to want to bring out our yog. Hmm? We could just bring out the yog into the dinosaurus, right? But we actually don't need to put the yog in the dinosaurus. It would be much more economical for us, knowing that that's an enigma, to use a naked yog. So we'll pay one credit to bring out the mem chip in the middle of the run, and then spend three more credits to bring out this yog all on its own outside the dinosaurus, successfully breaking through all of these ice and accessing and scoring the agenda. Was that a little complicated? Uh, I guess it was, but that's what makes Netrunner a lot of fun, right? Uh, if you have any questions about our buddy Personal Workshop, feel free to post them in the comments. And uh, we'll see you next time they release some card that no one knows how to use.